ஹலோ ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு லா எக்ஸலன்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த கரண்ட் அஃபேர்ஸ் ஃபார் பிகினர்ஸ் ப்ரோக்ராம் லெட் அஸ் சி வாட் ஆர் தி ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் ஃபார் டுடே தி ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஆர்டிகல் ஈஸ் ஆன் ஏர் குவாலிட்டி ஃப்ரம் திஸ் ஆர்டிகல் வி ஷுட் நோ வாட் இஸ் ஏர் குவாலிட்டி இண்டெக்ஸ் ஹியர் திஸ் ஆர்டிகல் ஈஸ் அபவுட் தி பொல்யூஷன் அண்ட் இட்ஸ் இம்பேக்ட் இன் டிஃப்ரெண்ட் ரீஜன்ஸ் இன் இண்டியா பட் லெட் அஸ் சி வாட் இஸ் ஏர் குவாலிட்டி இண்டெக்ஸ் Air Quality Index This index is released by Ministry of Environment and Forests This ministry releases this index based on 8 pollutant levels What are these 8 pollutants can be the question in our prelims examination Among them the first is particulate matter particulate matter 10 particulate matter 2.5 then comes no2 so2 these two are major components of vehicular pollution thermal power pollution and then we have methane nh3 we have ground ozone ozone is in general present in stratosphere troposphere in stratosphere it is very useful because it acts as a shield to the incoming uv radiations but in troposphere it is a pollutant then comes our carbon monoxide then lead these eight are the major pollutants that are measured under air quality index after measuring these pollutant levels this index gives these six categories of pollution levels this is one number one color one description this is given when this index was released it means for this particular number anything in this particular number one color coding is given one description is given to simplify the process of understanding the pollution levels for the common citizen this aqi is released and this is part of swachh bharat abhiyan swachh bharat abhiyan under this ministry of environment and forest it released air quality index this is published in central pollution control board in its website daily updates are given even for the real time update the screens are installed in all major cities for giving air quality indices or air quality levels in that particular place the next article is on nifa nifa virus here this virus is first discovered in malaysia in the country malaysia the one village name in that country is nifa so as this virus is first discovered in that particular place this is given name of nifa virus this virus is generally spread to fruit bats these are the primary host primary host means the virus first enters into one particular body because virus cannot exist on itself it needs some body as a host so it goes into this particular organism or animal here it breeds it multiplies and then from this host it spreads to other people or other animals this partic- for this particular nifa virus this fruit bats they act as primary host then it spreads to other animals for example here pigs pigs are most affected in this particular country when this nifa virus was discovered then it spread to pigs these pigs also act as a host they got affected they act as host from this host due to its fecus and all it spreads to others others other humans or other animals so this virus can affect both humans and animals this point we should remember and what are the symptoms of this virus fever headache disorientation mental confusion coma potentially death see it causes encephalitis encephalitis cephaly is cephaly means head encephalitis means head related diseases so because of that a person may go to coma or it leads to potential death here the prelims questions may be regarding 
the incubation period or regarding the symptoms the symptoms that are present over here or to whom it spreads like humans animals only humans only animals like that questions can be asked please go through this in detail once the next article is regarding the fading appeal of soft power india's foreign policy here one important thing that we should know is non aligned movement here we should know the background for formation of nam after world war 2 usa and ussr these two countries emerged as major powers in the world some of the countries they aligned with usa some of the countries they aligned with ussr so there are countries like in african continent asian continent that got independence after world war 1 majority of the countries in these two continents they got independence after world war 2 they were developing countries or underdeveloped countries so their development priority is to develop to provide basic services basic goods there to their citizens so they want to develop but if they join any of these blocks either usa side or ussr side they may be involved in the cold war cold war is a proxy war between usa and ussr before 1991 so these countries these developing and underdeveloped countries as their priority is development so they didn't want to enter into this particular cold war scenario so what they did is they remained non aligned non aligned means not to be aligned with any one block it means not with usa not with ussr permanently but based on the situation they may either support usa or ussr or they may take support from usa and ussr based on the situation but they are not principally aligned with any one country here there was this conference called bondung conference which was held in indonesia in this conference african and asian countries they gathered and they took a resolution of nam later they have formed a group called non alignment movement india is a founding member of nam now we have 120 member countries in nam here the question now is cold war situation is over now now there is there is no bipolar world now what is the relevance of nam is the question relevance of nam is it reducing or still does it hold any relevance is our main question this need to be discussed in detail it's our main question just think on that we'll discuss in the later videos next this article we need to know what is this exercise malabar malabar exercises this malabar exercises are annual naval exercises here initially when it was started in the year 1992 india and usa these two are the permanent members now Japan became permanent member in the Malabar exercise. We have two more non-permanent members. They are Australia, Singapore. Australia is actively seeking to become a permanent member of Malabar exercise. Here we need to remember it is a annual exercise. These three are the permanent members. These two are non-permanent members. These three point we should remember. for any exercises army joint exercises or naval exercise we should remember what the, what are the countries involved in it for how many years what is the time of conducting the exercise who are the non permanent members of that then what is the objective behind conducting that particular joint exercise these four points we should remember this is very important for our prelims 
here these three points we should remember the next article is a general one where i want to emphasize here national highways are mentioned over here but for our prelims examination we should remember the major corridors road corridors let us see what are those here in this map this red color one is a golden quadrilateral it connects delhi with kolkata delhi kolkata chennai bangalore and mumbai these four major cities are connected with the golden quadrilateral apart from this we have north south corridor which connects shrinagar to tuticorin then we have east west corridor which connects kandla and it extends to du union territory of du it connects the silchar silchar in the northeast these are major corridors road corridors or national highway corridors that we have so this is very important these are getting extended under our bharat mala program under bharat mala program these are connected with the border areas with ports etc so we should remember what are these corridors don't get confused with freight corridors we have delhi mumbai freight corridor that is rail corridor these are road corridors next article is on loans here we should know the credit structure in india credit in general is obtained in two ways formal credit informal credit informal credit we have banks and other organizations like microfinance institutions etc these are all called financial intermediaries because they act as intermediaries they get the deposits from some person or organization they give that particular money in the form of loan and then they gain some interest out of it some money through the interest rate so formal sector consists of banks and other institutions informal sectors like traditional money lenders friends family etc here banks these are of two types one commercial banks cooperative banks in this particular article commercial banks they have the obligation under priority sector lending in under this they need to provide 40% of their lending to the priority sector like agriculture small scale small and medium scale industries education housing loans ssg groups etc these are all priority sector out of this agriculture sector let's say for agriculture 100 rupees or 100 crores let's say 100 crores are given as agricultural loans the small and medium farmers they are getting only 30 to 40% of loans out of total disbursed loans the large farmers are getting the remaining amount it means 70 to 60% loans are given to the large farmers but small farmers small and medium farmers are getting 30 to 40% but if we compare it according to the population 70 to 80% of our farmers are small and medium only the remaining percentage are large farmers in comparison to their ratio this loan or credit given to them is very low this is one of the reasons for the crisis in agriculture in agriculture if these people are taking less amount from the formal sector banks are formal sector which offer loans at less interest rates these people what they are doing is they are taking loans from the informal sector from the money lenders where the interest rates are very high because of that the return on their farm products that will be low they have to pay huge amounts in the form of interest so whatever they are getting the profits are very low so 
credit of the formal sector for the small and medium farmers should increase the next article is on no discrimination on the basis of religion if we look at our fundamental rights part 3 of our constitution under this fundamental rights we have religious rights wherein we go for equal treatment of all religions equal treatment of all religions we follow secular principle here equal treatment means all religions are treated on par but state can interfere can intervene in the issues of religion there are exceptions to fundamental rights only article 17 is absolute right all other fundamental rights have some exceptions these religious rights also have exceptions among them based on some exceptions state can intervene in the issues of religion for example discrimination within the religion for such things state can intervene this is not important for us but under fundamental rights we need to read about religious rights and which we should know what is the concept of secularism of india what are the different features of secularism of east that is india secularism of west what are the differences between these two this we should know out of this particular article these are the two questions that i have given in this particular video let's solve this question tomorrow we'll give you answer for this question this question is on nifa second question is on nam try to answer these two questions in the comment section thank you